We've all heard the prayer the Lord Jesus spoke as a model to us in which he says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In this second part of our study called The Millennium Versus the Great Society, we'll learn exactly what Thy Kingdom Come on Earth really means. Welcome to the Sunday Sermon on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. I'm Steve Schwetz. Let's pray for and with one another now. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of your word and the gift of your spirit that helps us understand it. We listen now with open hearts. Fill us with all the wisdom and knowledge that comes from you alone. In Jesus' very precious name we pray. Amen. Here's the Sunday Sermon on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Probably the greatest theme of the Old Testament is the theocratic kingdom, or the millennium, as it is designated. And you find that when you come to the end of the Bible, it again looms large. And John, in the 20th chapter, probably says more in the way of specifics than has been said in the rest of Scripture, and yet we have chapter after chapter, psalm after psalm, that its great theme is the kingdom, just as this hymn, Joy to the world, the Lord is come, and you'll find that permeating all of these great passages of the past. But now we come to specifics And I'm turning tonight to the 20th chapter of Revelation, and I'd like to read a portion of this in your hearing. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And I'll break off the reading there. Our subject is the millennium versus the great society, the program of God for the earth. The great society, as I understand it, is the culmination of the efforts of man to build a millennium here on the earth in the past with its resultant failures and frustrations. That is, in the past there has not been success, but now this is a new effort that man is making in order to bring in the kingdom on the earth. It is actually the secularization of the post-millennial view to build the kingdom of God on earth without God, of course, and the thinnest veneer of religion. Actually, there's only a blush of Christianity on the surface of the program. And you find today, as now for years, the modernists did it, the post-millennialists before him and the liberals, they bandy about the language of the millennium. They take the jargon of the kingdom and they juggle it. They make commonplace these wonderful truths, and they've robbed much of the vocabulary that belongs to the millennium of its rich and its precious meaning. Let me illustrate the word peace. You hear that today in the UN. You hear it in Washington. You hear it in all of the great capitals of the world, and yet there's no peace. It's become a meaningless term, if you please. 
you hear the word righteousness. And how much of that do you see today? And you hear justice. And actually, how much of that is in evidence? You hear about the poor being helped. And I'm constantly hearing of those that are saying that this and a poverty program hasn't yet got down to the poor at all. It's been lodged somewhere with some politicians. You hear today about the sick being healed. You hear about protection and security. All of these things actually have been taken from the Word of God where God says, this is coming about on the earth at his appointed time and in his manner. Instead of seeing these that are words today, seeing them in action or seeing them in reality, we see these wonderful words that are so precious and pregnant in meaning. They become idle words used now by clever politicians. And in their place, we're seeing the raw and the ragged realities of life. And we hear about corruption. We hear about lawlessness. And we hear about immorality. Then there is an apostasy in the church. Now, may I say this, and I want to say it carefully tonight. If God's program is for the church or for any nation or for any individual, while the Lord Jesus Christ is away, to build the kingdom of heaven on earth, I'm prepared tonight to say that God has failed and that we ought to junk the program and try something else. May I say to you, I think that we need to recognize this is not God's program. I do not believe it's God's program for this present hour at all. The Word of God teaches something altogether different that's diametrically opposed to the present program that is being followed. Did you know that the church is doing the exact opposite of what God has called the church to do? We are called to preach a gospel to individuals. That will change them. And if they are changed, then society can be changed. But society can never be changed from the outside by any man-made program, my beloved, that's been tried again and again and again, and it has been a colossal failure. And what egotism for any man to think that he can somehow or another bring in a millennium on earth. Now, I want you to notice God's program for the earth. And the program of God, in spite of the, the present hour that's turned its back upon God, and the things of God and the Word of God, I still insist that the program of God is all important, and it is the program that will prevail. And I say this, and I say it kindly. The platform of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, and I'm not discussing politics, will not prevail. The UN is relatively unimportant as far as God is concerned, and the National Council of Churches just well stop as far as God's program is concerned. Now, this is what I mean. When I was a boy, I can remember how important the League of Nations was. Do any of you remember how important it was in those days? Do you remember President Wilson? I think he was a great man. I think that he got detoured because of post-millennialism. I preached in the First Presbyterian Church in Augusta, Georgia, and was actually asked to consider that pulpit when I was still a student in seminary. It's the great historic church of the South. It's where the Southern Presbyterian Church was organized. The first morning I preached there, I saw a little bronze tablet on the first pew. And after the service, I couldn't wait to get down there to see what it said. And it said something like this. It was in this pew that Woodrow Wilson sat with his mother when his father was pastor of this church. And his father was a post-millennialist. And President Wilson sincerely believed that you could bring in peace on this earth. He came back from Europe thoroughly believing that the European nations intended to have peace. And he thought that America was back of him in the program. May I say to you 
that that League of Nations tonight is relatively unimportant. In fact, it's trivial and it's puerile. It's an antique that you can place it with Orville Wright's Flying Jenny and the first Model T forward in the Smithsonian Institute. That's where it belongs tonight. And yet it hasn't been many years ago in the lifetime of many of us that was all important, and any preacher that preached against it was liable, because I knew a man that preached against it in those days. He said it would not work. He happened to be right, but they did not listen. I venture to say tonight that the great society and man's efforts through the, even the National Council of Churches in the next decade will be just another utopia that will go on the scrap heap of history and will actually be forgotten. May I say to you, these programs are programs that keep coming up, and the population of the world keeps following them like will o wisp paying no attention to God's program, and yet God has been moving down through the centuries with his program, my beloved. And the interesting thing is, he's on schedule tonight, and men are not on schedule tonight. Now will you notice God's program, for it's still relevant and it's still significant. I want you to notice, first of all, this a question, and it's a good question, it comes up often, how can God's kingdom be a thousand years and still be an everlasting kingdom? I think that you noticed in the scripture I read that it says, they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And yet we find that Daniel in the second chapter, verse 44, said, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now, here is a kingdom that's a thousand years, and then here is a kingdom that is to last forever. How can you articulate these two? And then again, I want to turn to the book of Daniel to the seventh chapter, verse 13. Listen to this. I saw in the night visions. Behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory, and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Now someone says, how do you reconcile the fact that it is thousand years and it's an everlasting kingdom? May I say to you that the thousand-year reign of Christ is the prelude to the everlasting kingdom, and it is another period of trial, actually, for the earth under ideal conditions. And that's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 when he gave God's program here. He began with the fact that of the resurrection of Christ. He says that he's the first fruits of those that sleep. Then he moved like this. But every man in his own order. He's giving the order of resurrection. Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming. That's the next step in God's program, is to take those that are Christ, raise them from the dead. Then cometh the end, that is, his program for the church, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Now listen, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. He's coming to this earth to establish his kingdom. He will subdue it in that thousand years, and we'll see certain characteristics of that kingdom in a moment. And then, at the end of that period, he intends to move back to his place in the Trinity. Listen to this. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. That's the great enemy of man today. Actually, not communism. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith, all things are put under him, 
it's manifest that he's accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Now, what he's saying is this, that he's coming to this earth to subdue it and to bring it back under the control of God. And after he reigns here a thousand years, we find the devil has been loose for a season. He's put down immediately. All rebellion is then removed. He returns back to his place in the Trinity that God might be God, my beloved. He goes back to his place there so that the thousand-year period is the kingdom period that he's bringing this earth back in under the control of Almighty God. It's a tremendous program, if you please. So that the thousand years is, as it were, it's the foyer, or the vestibule that leads into the everlasting kingdom. When he brings the earth under control, returns back to the Father, and then the everlasting kingdom begins. It actually is a continuation then of his reign upon the earth. Now will you notice that God's present purpose today concerns a minority movement. And a great many folks are not willing to believe that, and they don't like to accept it. Liberalism for years has been losing out. You've noticed, liberal churches tonight do not have a Sunday evening service. I had a liberal preacher, I played golf with him, and he said to me, you don't mean to tell me that a thousand people come out on Sunday night. I said, yes. If he asked me that one time, he asked me that a hundred times. He just didn't believe that in these days. Now, for years, they've been losing out. There's been no question about that, and I think fundamentalism is today also. But nevertheless, liberalism has been losing out. And this young liberal preacher said to me the other day, we want to get involved again. They've been doing nothing for years. And candidly, and I say this very candidly, the seminaries are not teaching men to preach today at all. That's the reason there's so few preachers today. They're not even teaching them to preach. So they've got to do something, and they've got now involved in these movements on the outside to do something to earn their pay and earn their keep. And that is the thing that's sending many men out of the pulpit because people have not been coming. But we need to recognize, as I said to him, God's present purpose is a minority movement. He's calling out a people to his name, and that's the meaning of the church. The church is ecclesia, kaleo, to call, ek, to call out of. And it's actually the opposite of ecumenical. Ecumenical comes from a word meaning house, oikos. And it means the world. And it means that today they're trying to get the world in some organization when God's purpose is to call a people out of the world to Christ, if you please. That's his minority movement today that's in the world, and it's the greatest minority movement. We're told we're strangers and pilgrims in the earth. And remember what John says, little flock. Oh my, if God's people could only recognize that. We love numbers, don't we? We do it here every Sunday night. But it's little flock. That's what he's saying. Now he's going to remove this church from this earth. After he completes his purpose in the church, it'll be taken out of the earth. Then he'll proceed to set up his kingdom upon the removal of the church and the setting up of the kingdom by his coming to the earth. There is that period of the great tribulation. The great tribulation is the next program for this earth. And I think that we're seeing a preparation in the world today for that. There's many evidences that the world's getting ready for the great tribulation period. And friends, there is coming the great tribulation and not the great society. I can tell you that tonight on the authority of the Word of God. Now, when Christ comes, certain things are going to take place. First of all, there will be judgment. Now, I know there are those that don't like to hear that, but there's going to be judgment. And the reason for that, I think, ought to be very obvious. 
There are a lot of things wrong in this world that have to be straightened out. In Matthew, the 24th chapter, our Lord speaks of his coming to this earth, and this is the Olivet Discourse, and it doesn't have anything to do with this age or where we are today in the church. It looks forward to the future, and he says, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And then he goes on to say, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and glory. And everything from there on in this Olivet Discourse has to do with judgment. He gives parables of the ten virgins, the separation five wise, five foolish. He gives the judgment that concerns the giving out of talents, if you please. And then he speaks in verse 31 of chapter 25, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations. He shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goat. If there is one thing that is clear from Genesis to Revelation, it is that he is coming to judge this earth someday. And the kingdom is introduced by his coming to judge the earth, my beloved. You find that again and again. Listen to Revelation 1, 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. That doesn't look like that that's a joyful coming for his own at all. And of course it's not. And then the great chapter on that is Revelation 19. Listen to this, verse 11. I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes a flame of fire. The armies in heaven followed him. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp two-edged sword. My beloved, he's coming in judgment to this earth. And that is necessary in order that those that enter the kingdom might be those that have yielded obedience to him on this earth, and he'll put down all rebellion at that time that's on this earth. Now, there are great physical changes that are to take place on this earth, physical changes that even here in Southern California with all the scrapers, they can't bring it to pass. Some of these great physical changes have to do with the topography, really, of the earth. You read in Isaiah 35, for instance, verse 6, Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out in the streams in the desert, and the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. Have you ever stopped to think how much of this earth's service is not only water, but how much is desert today? Think of how much California is desert today. And all of that will be eliminated in the millennium. Then there's some other changes that are to take place. Listen to Isaiah the 11th chapter. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. A little child shall lead them, and a cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. You see, there'll be an absolute change even in nature today when he comes to this earth. And we're also told the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And that, of course, is not true today. Think of the ignorance there is of God throughout this world tonight. But the day is coming when the knowledge of God will cover this entire earth. That's part of his program. Now, there is something else that I think we need to get clear about the millennium. It's going to be the time, I think, when the greatest work will be done on this earth. It's going to be a time of great labor, only at that time that it'll not be or with the sweat of the brow. It will be at that time with great joy. 
Isaiah 62, verse 8, speaking of this period, says, The Lord hath sworn by his right hand and by the arm of his strength, Surely I will no more give thy corn to be meat for thine enemies, and the sons of the strangers shall not drink thy wine, for the which thou hast labored. But they that have gathered it shall eat it, and praise the Lord. And they that have brought it together shall drink it in the courts of my holiness. And then in Isaiah 65, verse 21, they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. It's going to be the time of the greatest works program this world has ever seen, and it will be a time when the curse of sin is removed, of course, from the earth. And the reign of Christ during that period is going to be absolute. Notice how Psalm 2 puts it, he shall break them in pieces with a rod of iron, and he's going to rule with a rod of iron, an absolute reign of Christ upon the earth. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river unto the ends of the earth. That's Psalm 72, verse 8. And yet, friends, it's in the period of the millennium that there will be rebellion against God and against the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ under ideal condition. With him reigning on the earth, personally, there will be rebellion. Listen to this, Isaiah 66, 24, And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. This is the picture that is given of the rebellion that will be against God in that day. And Zechariah is rather specific. In the 14th chapter, verse 16, he says, It shall come to pass that every one that's left of all the nations that came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. Then he mentions specifically the family of Egypt, and so on. Now, someone says, wait just a minute again. You say there's to be rebellion, and yet you said these coming in judgment and only those that are obedient to God. Well, did you know that during the millennium there will be the reproduction of the human family? And you talk about a population explosion. You haven't seen any yet. Wait till you get into the millennium. There will be the greatest population explosion that the world's ever seen. And it's the children of those who grow up because they have a fallen nature, you see. The nature has not been changed at that time on the earth. And these will join in, that is, not all of them, but certainly I would say a majority of them will join in a rebellion against God. Now notice that there is the reproduction in a millennium. Jeremiah 30, verse 20, Their children also shall be as aforetime, and their congregation shall be established before me, and I will punish all that oppress them. Again, the idea of God punishing during the millennium, you see, in connection with these children that are born during that particular period. I'm only citing tonight one or two passages of Scripture for each one of these. I could give you a whole sheaf of quotations. This is the great theme of Scripture, you see. And then in Ezekiel, the 47th chapter, verse 22, It shall come to pass that ye shall divide it by lot for an inheritance unto you and to the strangers that sojourn among you, which shall beget children among you. And they shall be unto you as born in the country among the children of Israel. They shall have inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel, so that there will be born in the millennium, there will be born children. There is the reproduction of the human family in that period. Now, again, I come to that which is the final thought that we want to bring tonight. 
one of the things that the Armalanalyst, and I studied under Armalanalyst in my denominational seminary, some of them very fine men, don't misunderstand me, and one of them, no one could exalt the person of Christ in his first coming any more than he did. But he was Armalanalyst, and he did not believe there'd be a millennium. And one of his criticisms was this. He said, the trouble with you premillennialists is you think it's a physical kingdom, just a materialistic kingdom with planet E. And we know that it's not that, that it's a spiritual kingdom. May I say to you that we believe it's a spiritual kingdom. It has these physical aspects to it, but the fact it has physical aspects doesn't keep it from being spiritual. You know, this auditorium, we remodeled this that you're sitting in tonight. Now, that doesn't keep it from being, because we've improved it, that doesn't keep it from being a place where there can uh, not be a spiritual emphasis, you see. And because the millennium will be ideal, and all conditions are ideal, that doesn't preclude it from being a spiritual kingdom. May I say that these men have misunderstood and they have misstated something. There is a difference between a spiritual kingdom and to spiritualize the kingdom, all the difference in the world. And so they've spiritualized it, evaporated, and that's the reason they're all millennialists. There's no millennium, they say, because they try to insist it's spiritual. The verse they use is John 18, verse 36, and I, I'm confident I've heard this a hundred times. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from him. Now they say, you see, he says, his kingdom's not of this world. Well, what do you mean by that? He's talking to Pilate, and what he's saying to Pilate is just simply this. Pilate, my kingdom will not be established as the Roman Empire was, and my kingdom does not depend upon a standing army. My kingdom does not have the same beginnings. It's not oriented into the world as the kingdoms of this world are. But he didn't say it wasn't on this earth. And he didn't say that it didn't have certain physical attributes. He merely said that this is a kingdom that doesn't depend upon the world today. It doesn't depend. And that's my reason for believing what's happened yonder in Israel is no fulfillment of prophecy whatsoever. When he establishes a kingdom, he'll not use the United Nations to do it, my beloved. He doesn't depend upon the apparatus of this earth. He depends upon that which is spiritual. Now, there's been, therefore, I think in the church and even among us, an unnatural separation of secular and sacred. This idea today that tomorrow, Monday morning, you move into the secular world. My friend, there's something wrong today when you attempt to draw a line between that which is sacred and that which is secular. And so the kingdom has many things that are physical, but it's a spiritual kingdom, if you please. And there is today the present existence of the kingdom of God on earth. Paul said to the Colossians, ye've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness, into the kingdom of the Son of his love. And every child of God that accepts Christ, he comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's brought him to the church, but that that brings him into the church brings him also into that larger issue, the kingdom, if you please, where men bow to the king. And that's the thing that disturbs me about a great many people that are church members that are not obeying him, my beloved. We need to bow to him today. He's still the king, if you please. And in this age there is that existence of the kingdom only in the hearts of those who will bow to him in this hour. But he's coming someday to establish his kingdom. Now when he comes, there are certain things going to prevail that are spiritual. I've already mentioned this. The knowledge of God, we are told, will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. There are many scriptures, Jeremiah 31, 33, and 34. I'll not turn to that. Righteousness and truth will cover this earth. And what a picture is given to us in the Word of God. Listen to Isaiah 26, 2. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. 
And then Isaiah 33, 5, The Lord is exalted, for he dwelleth on high. He hath filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. My, these are pictures, my beloved, of that which is coming on the earth. And one final reference, Isaiah 62, verse 1, For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I'll not rest, until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation therefore as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. All the scriptures that speak of this kingdom that's coming, and the spiritual implications that are connected with it, and then there will be peace on the earth. Let me give just this reference, Psalm 72, 7, In his days shall the righteous flourish an abundance of peace, so long as the moon endureth. What a picture this is, my beloved. Now there is something else. There will be joy. And I find very little joy today. The fact of the matter is you see very little joy today, even among God's people. But there will be joy in the kingdom. Will you listen to this scripture, Isaiah 12, 3? Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. And Isaiah 61, 3, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. It's going to be wonderful to be in a kingdom where everybody's happy. Now, in conclusion, let me mention this. There will be in the millennium the power of the Holy Spirit as it has never been manifested before in this world. I want you to notice tonight several scriptures in this connection. First is Ezekiel, the 36th chapter, verse 24. For I will take you from among the heathen. I'll gather you out of all countries. I'll bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart. And friends, that's the thing that is essential today, is a new heart. You can't build a kingdom or a great society down here with people who are wrong in their own hearts. They are absolutely sinners. They don't recognize it, will not recognize it. That has to be recognized. And believe me, God's going to recognize it. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. What wonderful scriptures these are, my beloved, that have to do with this. There's one other scripture that has to do with this, and it's one that is certainly misquoted today, and I'm sure you know where I'm turning. I'm turning now to Joel, the second chapter, and this is so often used as if it was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, and I think that any reasonable person can see in a moment it was not fulfilled on Pentecost. Peter didn't say it was fulfilled. He said, this is that which was spoken. He didn't say it was fulfilled. He said to these, for he was talking to a hundred percent Jewish congregation. He said, listen, the thing that I'm saying to you is that you think that it's strange that these people are filled with the Holy Spirit. I want you to know that your own word says there's a day coming when all flesh, all flesh shall have the Spirit poured out upon them. Now, it wasn't poured out on all flesh, was it, at the day of Pentecost? The thing that was obvious, it was just a few, very few, a very small minority. And believe me, they were a minority, and they were the only ones. There's never been a time for 1,900 years that the Spirit's been poured out on all flesh. Joel has not been fulfilled. If it has, God has a funny way of fulfilling Scripture, which is different than he's been doing in the past. He always fulfills literally. And Peter was very careful to quote all of it. He said there'd be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars. And was, did that take place on the day of Pentecost? And of course it didn't. So let's be reasonable. 
Now, this is to be fulfilled in the millennium. It shall come to pass afterward. After what? After he comes to this earth to establish his kingdom, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old man shall dream dreams. Your young man shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out of my Spirit. He hasn't done that yet. May I say to you, there is a glorious day coming when he will pour out his Spirit upon all flesh and this poor, weak human beings that we are, as we are tonight, all of us. And in that day, those on the earth will have the Spirit of God poured out upon them. And what a glorious thing it'll be. You see, they have not been glorified in a new body. Those that enter the millennium, they have an altogether different body than the saints that are taken to be with him in heaven. And it will be required that they will be filled with the Spirit of God in a new way. And that's exactly what he says he's going to do. And I'll show wonders in the heavens, in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, moon into blood. And you articulate that with the end of the great tribulation period when it comes to this earth. And he says it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. And that's that 144,000 that has gone out throughout the earth, bearing this message that the kingdom is ready to be set up upon the earth, and they'll be saved the same as you and I by the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. My friend, it's well to get a perspective of what God's doing today. God is working today with a minority group. He has not yet moved out on the world stage to set up his kingdom because tonight Peter says he's long-suffering and he's patient and he's not willing that any should perish. He wants to, today to move into your heart. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. It's in a day like this that he's moved and he's moved into where human hearts are. And he says, I want him. I can transform. I can help you. And that's my program for today. I have no program for marching right now. I have no program for making even the world better right now. I can make you better, and you in turn can go out into society and make it better. That's the only way that it can be improved. He wants to move into your heart. Has he moved in? He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, if any man, that means any man. It means you have to do it. If he's moved heaven and hell to get to the door of your heart. But when he got there, he stopped and knocked. He wouldn't crash the door and he won't come in unless you let him in. You have to let him in. We've got more great teaching from the book of Isaiah this week on the daily Bible program of Through the Bible, so you can listen if you like by app or online at ttb.org or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE for all your listening options. Now as we go, I'm Steve Schwetz, praying that no matter what's on your to-do list or what you face this week, that you remember that Philippians 4.13 promises that we can do all things through Him who strengthens us. Join us each weekday for our five-year daily study through the whole Word of God. Check for times on this station or look for Through the Bible in your favorite podcast store and always at ttb.org.